As a kid, I used to dream about the oceans. It was this wild place full of color and life, home to these alien-looking, fantastical creatures. I pictured massive sharks ruling the food chain and graceful sea turtles dancing across coral reefs. As a marine biologist turned photographer, I've spent most of my career looking for places as magical as those I used to dream about when I was little. And it's this journey that I wish to share with you all this evening. <laughs> so, one of the most common questions I receive from people is, what is the most terrifying moment of your career? Now, being in my shoes at this moment must be really, really, really scary. And, you know, I'll be honest, I am scared. I'm scared of overexposing. I'm scared of <laughs> underexposing. I'm scared of getting the sharks out of focus, and I'm scared that my editors are not gonna like a single picture that I'm taking. The sharks, they are probably the least of my concern right now. And, you know, and remember, these are pretty small sharks, six foot at the most. So if sharks are not the scariest part of my job, well, what is? There's one creature that if it congregates in large enough numbers, it scares the crap out of me. And this is what these creatures look like. <laughs> the scariest moments of my photographic career are without a camera on a stage looking over an ocean of people. You know, give me a white shark or a sharknado any day of the week. But I'm getting ahead of myself here, way ahead of myself. And like with any good story, I think we have to begin right at the beginning. Now, I began exploring bodies of water at a fairly young age. <laughs> hey, they were a lot smaller than the ones I explore now, but at that stage, I thought you know, they were probably as exciting as the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean are for me today. Let's fast forward. Today, my photography is largely anchored in conservation, and you know, with conservation photography, you have two approaches. I call it the carrot and the stick approach. On the one hand, you can showcase them the most amazing places on this planet and make them go wow. I could not believe a place like St. Joseph Atoll could exist, and then hopefully they make a connection with it. So for half the year, I have this incredible privilege to document some of the most amazing marine realms on our planet. However, as a photojournalist, I need to document the reality of our relationship with the ocean. So for the other half of the year, I document what I sort of call the darker side of our relationship with the sea, whether it's overfishing, the impacts of climate change, or oil spills. But I always feel like I walk a very fine line between inspiring and disturbing. When young photographers always ask me, what is the sort of number one tip you can give me? I always say, begin in your backyard. Begin with a subject and a place that you are intimately familiar with and a place that you can go back to again and again and again. In South Africa, I had a pretty sexy backyard. I mean, I was lucky. And my first sort of real reportage story was about great white sharks. You know, 12 years ago, I think when I shot this, this was the sort of standard white shark image. You know, focus on the teeth, aggressive, dangerous, wild. And these sort of pictures are easy to take. However, the more time I spent out at sea with them, the less I felt that that picture was accurate. Instead of the aggressive, you know, you know dangerous right shark, I was, I was seeing an inquisitive and very often curious creature. The image that follows is the one picture that I think best represents the white shark to me. And this was taken on one of those wonderful winter days, the water was clear, the sea was calm, and you know, this white shark came across this little box jellyfish. And I thought it would either swim through it or just ignore it. And for a few seconds, this white shark actually almost hovered as if it was transfixed by the light on the tentacle. And it just kind of you know, hovered there and just looked as if going, hello, what are you? And you know, after she had satisfied her curiosity, that's a three and a half meter female, by the way, um, she just kind of you know, turned back and went back into the depths. And, and, and that is sort of how I know great whites, not you know, with the images before. My next reportage was also in Southern Africa again, but the focus here is on sardines. Now, sardines are a cold water fish, and they prefer the west and south coast where the water is colder. However, once a year, something unusual happens. We have this warm current on the east coast called the Agalos Current. And once a year, it kind of moves offshore. And these sardines migrate with this cold water northwards. And we call this the sardine run. And you know, sardines heavily overfished over the years. And this is a species that really needs the conservation attention. But everyone thinks it lives in tin cans. You know, it's not just the fishing fleets that follow these sardines. There's a whole suite of predators that follows them as well. Common dolphins. They carve smaller pieces of sardines off the massive shoals and they pin 
and herd them up to the surface. And you know, there they form the holy grail for all photographers, the bait ball. <laughs> I've done the run for eight years. I've seen three. So the dolphins herd the sardines, and they take turns. You know, One after the other will rush in, grab a sardine, and swim out, and take turns like that. Amazing cooperative behavior there. But for me, sardine run, it's all about sharks. Now, when there's no dolphins, these sharks have a really hard time. They get sardine donuts, as we call them, <laughs> mouths full of water most of the time. When the dolphins are there, the sardines tend to be herded together much, much more closely. Working with sharks on the run is a little bit spicy at times, especially at the end when there's very few sardines left. They treat you like another shark. So you get bumped and hit probably every 10 seconds. You know, if you want to get good pictures, you just have to ignore the sharks knocking into you. Most of the time, I know I'm not on the menu. These sharks feed on small sardines. But I had two encounters. One, I had a large dusky shark rip off my fin and swim away with it. What's that all about? Why does that shark need another fin? I, I have no idea. And then another one, I had two bronze whaler sharks, each hanging onto my underwater strobes. And I thought like a Ukrainian weightlifter. And I was trying to punch. They obviously like when the strobe recycles, there seems to be an electrical current that kind of you know, gets pushed out. So they, they love biting on those things. This is my favorite sardine run photograph for two reasons. One, it was in clear water, and you know, it looks like the shark is inhaling the sardines. And right after this, he basically swings around and comes at me. And you can see these little sardine heads and tails sticking out. It's like an overstuffed suitcase with the clothes hanging out. That's what that reminded me of. It was just one of those you know, interesting visual scenes there. But yeah, you know, that's one of those images you know, once every eight years, if you're lucky. At the end of the you know, bait ball, when there's few sardines left, where do they want to go? in between your legs, under your arms, around your head. The sardines are seeking shelter around you, which is a really, really bad place to be, not just because of the sharks. There's actually a bigger danger on the run. I'm photographing, and I'm looking at my screen at something. And as I look up, all the predators are gone. You know, it's just me and the sardines, and we're looking at each other going, oh, what just happened? You know, they're too stunned to actually swim away because they don't know what's going on. That just doesn't happen. Instinct kicks in, and I go, I'm going where they've gone. I'm back paddling. I'm swimming out of the bait ball. And, um, this guy comes rocketing out of nowhere. It's a bride's whale. And um, he comes up, and he pretty much in front of me swallows the entire bait ball. <laughs> oh, done. I'm probably a foot or two away. And as he does that, he, he arches upwards, and then he pretty much just leaves the water. I mean, you know, they have all this energy, and he leaps out of the water. Two thirds come up, and I am more or less right at the left where the sardine is leaping out. And um, I'm going, oh, crap. Um, so I curl into this little ball, and I'm waiting for the sound of hearing my own bones break. But I've been trained well. I'm still shooting. <laughs> and the next picture, I have no recollection. I have no memory, but I have this. So this is all the water streaming out of the bride's whale's mouth. And um, I don't remember this. Somebody else could have taken this. It was in my camera at the end of the day. It's very hard to see you know, in still. So this is sort of a, some video of a colleague of mine to really get the idea of the whole how quick and how crazy a bait ball actually is. Imagine trying to get still pictures in that. And you have to be where those sharks are. You have to be one of those sharks to get the pictures. So it gets a bit, a bit crazy at times. But... And this is where the birds are just you know, using their wings and, and, and a couple of sharks. And here comes the bride's whale. So now you get an idea sort of what your environment is like. And you sort of just have to, have to just you know, you know, forget about all that stuff and just focus on the task at hand, which is getting great images.